supposedly there's a sixth Pirates of the Caribbean movie coming out at some point in the future. We know basically nothing about it. Who's starring, who's writing, who's directing, what the plot will be, when it'll come out, if it's coming out at all. All that's completely up in the air. To most of the general population, the very idea of a new movie in this series seems ridiculous, pointless, a waste of time and money. The last two Pirates movies were not super great. The franchise is basically the poster child for the diminishing returns of blockbuster sequels. The general assumption is that making any new movie in this series is an exercise in futility. But I have to wonder, if this thing ever gets made, is it possible, even remotely possible, to make a new Pirates movie that's actually good? The Pirates franchise is something that's fascinated me for a long time. The first movie, The Curse of the Black Pearl, I think is in my personal top 10 favorite movies of all time. There's so much about these movies that feels so distinct and special. But I'm also just as fascinated by the cultural response to this series as it goes on. People keep showing up to see these movies in theaters, over and over again. Even though everyone seems to universally agree that they keep getting progressively worse. I want to really dig into the heart of what makes these movies work. And what makes them not work. I want to understand the path this series has taken over the nearly two decades it's been around, to see how it ended up in its current state, a punchline about Hollywood milking a franchise dry. And most importantly, I want to sift through as much of the franchise as I possibly can to determine whether there really is a path forward for more sequels. So I did a rewatch of all five movies, and I also combed through YouTube and watched tons and tons of video essays, analyzing what does or doesn't work about them. By the end of this giant video, I'll have enough information to determine if there is a way to make a sixth Pirates movie that's actually good. So hold on to your hats because this is going to be a long one. I'm going to start by going through a brief summary of all five movies. Because even if you've seen all five, I'm willing to bet there are lots of details you forgot about, and stuff that you can't remember which movie it's from. The first movie in the series was 2003's Pirates of the Caribbean The Curse of the Black Pearl. It was based on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disney Parks. This goes without saying, I'm sure, but a movie based on a theme park ride has no business being any good. Just look at Jungle Cruise. The rocks you see here in the river are sandstone, but some people just take them for granted. It's one of my bolder attractions. But Curse of the Black Pearl pulled off the impossible. It was a huge hit, and for good reason. The story generally follows three main characters. Elizabeth Swan, the upper-class girl who feels stifled by a life of luxury, Will Turner, the poor blacksmith's apprentice who is secretly in love with Elizabeth, and Jack Sparrow, Captain, Captain Jack Sparrow, the former captain of the pirate ship The Black Pearl before his first mate Barbosa led a mutiny. After Barbosa took control of The Black Pearl, he and his crew found themselves some cursed Aztec gold, which turned them into undead skeleton pirates. They kidnap Elizabeth, hoping to use her in a ritual to break the curse. This forces Will and Jack to team up. Will wants to rescue Elizabeth, and Jack wants his ship back. They track the pearl down, break the curse, and kill Barbosa. And Will and Elizabeth get together, happily ever after. This movie is incredible, 10 out of 10, and it was a massive critical and commercial success. Most people attribute the film's success to Johnny Depp's performance as Jack Sparrow. His strange outfit, drunken stumbling, heavily improvised dialogue, and the sense that you never really understand what's going on inside his head easily make him the most memorable part of the movie. It's not possible. Not probable. Curse of the Black Pearl was great. It was also a self-contained story that wrapped up most loose ends. But that never stopped Hollywood from greenlighting a sequel before. The screenwriters did a pretty good job with the second movie though, all things considered. Dead Man's Chest is about Jack Sparrow on the run from Davy Jones. Because it turns out that Jack made a deal with him sometime before the first movie where he traded his soul for the Black Pearl. So in order to cheat death, Jack is trying to find Davy Jones' heart, which Jones had cut out of his chest and buried somewhere, to use his leverage all the while running away from Jones's ship, the Flying Dutchman, and his pet, the Kraken. But the British Navy is also looking for the heart. They arrest Will and Elizabeth on account of all the pirate stuff they did in the last movie, and force them to go after Jack and track down the heart for them. All these factions chasing after the heart culminate in a final showdown where it keeps changing hands. But ultimately, the British government get their hands on the heart, meaning they can force Davy Jones to carry out their will, essentially giving them total control over the entire ocean. And Jack and the Pearl get swallowed up by the Kraken. 
The movie ends on a cliffhanger where all the good guys discuss a possible plan to rescue Jack from Davy Jones' locker, and Barbosa comes back to life. This leads straight into the third movie, At World's End, which is the one where Davy Jones stands in a bucket. The British Navy plan to use the Flying Dutchman to wipe out all pirates in the world, so Will, Elizabeth, and the now a good guy Barbosa sail to World's End to rescue Jack from the Underworld. Then they call together a consortium of pirates from all over the world to come together and make their final stand. We also learn that Davy Jones used to be a regular guy, who fell in love with a sea goddess, Calypso, before things went sour and he turned bitter at the world and cut out his heart. Calypso, by the way, is that weird voodoo lady who's been hanging around for the last movie or so. We also learn that anyone who kills Davy Jones by stabbing his heart will be cursed to take his place. There's a lot of bickering and betrayal and interplay between lots of different factions along the way, but in the end, the Black Pearl defeats the Flying Dutchman, and Will stabs the heart. And that's the end of the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy, if you want to call it that. It's not the last movie in the franchise, but it certainly felt like a definitive ending. The writing wraps up basically every thread, and the sense of scale gives the impression of a big finish. This is also the last movie in the series directed by Gore Verbinski, and the last movie to feature Will and Elizabeth in the leading roles. But still, the series kept going. The fourth movie, On Stranger Tides, has Jack Sparrow get shanghaied onto Captain Blackbeard's ship, yes, that Blackbeard, on a search for the Fountain of Youth. Besides Jack, the only characters who come back from previous movies are Barbosa, working for the British Navy as a privateer, and Gibbs, Jack's right-hand man. For the most part, this movie is full of new faces. It introduces Blackbeard, and Angelica, Blackbeard's daughter and Jack's former-slash-current love interest. It also introduces two new characters, a priest and a mermaid, who have a love story as the film's C-plot. I don't remember their names. I could look them up, but I don't care what their names are. No one does, they sucked. Anyway, the movie ends with Blackbeard dead, the Fountain of Youth gone, and Jack Sparrow ready to sail off to his next adventure. And then we get to the fifth and most recent movie, Dead Men Tell No Tales. Which, whether or not the writing is any better, is at least more connected to its roots than On Stranger Tides. Alongside Jack Sparrow, our two new leads are Henry Turner, the now grown-up son of Will and Elizabeth, and Karina, who is later revealed to be Barbosa's daughter. This movie's villain is Captain Salazar, yet another undead pirate captain who Jack screwed over when he was a lot younger. Everybody is after the Trident of Poseidon, which can apparently break any ocean-related curse. They find the Trident and discover that breaking it will break every curse at sea? Yeah, I don't know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And Barbosa sacrifices himself to take out Salazar and make sure all the good guys get out alive. Henry returns home to find that the curse of his father is broken, and we get cameos from Will and Elizabeth. In general, each movie is worse than the one that came before it. As to how many of them are actively bad, well, it depends on who you ask. But we're a far cry from the quality of Curse of the Black Pearl. That's where the series is left off. We're five movies in, with almost all major characters other than Jack gone from the story and a general audience that seems to have lost all patience. So let's get down to business. We'll start by taking an extended look at the first movie, because that's the one movie in the franchise that's pretty much universally beloved. What was it about this movie that worked so well? There's the obvious, like the acting. I already talked about Johnny Depp as Jack Sparrow. His performance really is one of a kind. But just as important, I think, is Joffrey Rush as Barbosa. See, Jack Sparrow is cool, but he's not really a pirate, per se. Depp famously modeled his performance after Keith Richards, coming across more like a drugged-out rock star than a pirate captain. But Barbosa, that guy, is a capital P pirate. From his outfit to his accent, he's channeling the stories we've all grown up hearing about people like Blackbeard or Captain Flint. I'm disinclined to acquiesce to your request. Means no. He has an intensity and gravitas that lets him steal any scene he's in, including the ones he has with Jack. And let's not discount Orlando Bloom or Kira Knightley, who besides serving as the straight men for Jack and Barbosa to bounce off of, bring a serious emotional core to what could have been a really silly, frivolous story. I practice three hours a day so that when I meet a pirate, I can kill it! Well, I suppose if it is worthless, then there's no point in me keeping it. No. The other big detail that everyone points to as the reason why this movie works so well is the way it incorporated improv. Famously, Jack Sparrow was a pretty minor and simplistic character as written, but Johnny Depp took the role and just went wild with it. A ton of his weird, wacky dialogue was improvised, helping to make him feel constantly unpredictable. The higher-ups at Disney apparently hated his performance and tried to make him tone it down, but thankfully they failed. This movie benefited a ton from having Depp's hand in the script. This is either madness 
Oh, brilliant. It's remarkable how often those two traits coincide. There's plenty more you can talk about from a filmmaking perspective. Awesome and creative action scenes, cool set pieces, and visual effects that still hold up to this day. But I'd like to zero in on the writing, since that's what I know best. Because this movie has some of the tightest writing of any movie I've ever seen. In his hour-long video breaking down everything that makes this movie great, Stefan Krosej repeatedly points out how crazy efficient every scene is. And you'll see that a lot in this movie. Throughout a large portion of this film, scenes will be doing more than one thing at a time, which is why you'll find yourself engaged pretty much the entire time. While they're giving you exposition, they're also giving you character. When they set up plot points, you don't even notice because they're also simply entertaining you with a fun scene. It's the classic magician's trick of misdirection. I'm especially impressed with how deeply every scene characterizes each member of the cast. Will, in particular, has the strongest character arc in the movie. At the start of the movie, Will hates pirates and resents having to team up with Jack, but eventually he comes to understand that being a pirate isn't all bad. You can accept that your father was a pirate and a good man, or you can't. The pirate is in your blood, boy, so you'll have to square with that someday. And Elizabeth is far from the typical damsel in distress. She also learns to think like a pirate and in the process breaks free of the role society is determined for her. Bye. You like pain? <laughs> Try wearing a corset. And every action that Jack Sparrow takes implies so much hidden death that we might never get to see. He appears to be a drunken buffoon on the surface, but that's punctuated with occasional flashes of brilliance and anger that make you wonder how much of this goofiness is just an act. After you've killed Norrington's men, every last one. If there's one thing I can highlight about the writing of this movie though, one thing that I think it does better than any other movie out there, it's the way it handles exposition. Later movies in the series get a lot of flack for being way too convoluted, especially the third one. But let's just stop for a second and go through the plot of Curse of the Black Pearl. Go through everything you have to understand in order for the story to make sense. Okay, so before the beginning of the movie, Jack Sparrow was the captain of the Black Pearl, but as they were searching for a stash of lost asset gold, his first mate Barbosa led a mutiny against him and abandoned him on an island somewhere. Barbosa and Cole then found the gold and spent it all, but that action unleashed a curse on all the pirates that turns them into undead, unfeeling skeletons. They look normal during the daytime, but under the moonlight their curse is revealed. In order to undo the curse, the pirates have to collect every coin of the treasure they spent and return it to where they found it, along with a drop of blood from each of them. Luckily for them, the coins emit a kind of homing beacon whenever one of them touches water. But besides the obvious difficulty of collecting all these coins, they also face another problem. One member of their crew, Bootstrap Bill Turner, spoke out against the decision to mutiny against Jack. So the other pirates tied him to a rock and dropped him into the ocean, but they need his blood to break the curse. Bill Turner is Will Turner's father, and at the start of the movie, Will had given an Aztec coin he got from his father to Elizabeth Swan. Also, Will doesn't know that his dad was a pirate. When the pirates attack Port Royal and get back the last coin, they also kidnap Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, thinking that they kidnapped her to hold her for ransom since she's the governor's daughter, lies and says her name is Elizabeth Turner. That's when the pirates realize a way out, using the blood of Bill Turner's descendant. Except they don't realize that Elizabeth lied about her last name and that the blood they actually need is Will's. <sighs> Every bit of that information I just laid out is absolutely essential to understanding what's going on in the movie. If you're missing even a little bit of it, nothing that's happening will make any sense to you. And yet, this movie doesn't feel especially convoluted. Why? Because the script finds tons of little ways to expertly weave all the important information in as it goes. The first smart thing the movie does is spread its exposition out. It doesn't front load everything in the first five minutes. There's no Star Wars style opening crawl to catch you up. These tidbits of info come organically, and it's only when they're absolutely necessary to know. When the movie starts, all we really know is that the Black Pearl is chasing after these gold coins. Then after Elizabeth takes the coin out and it gets wet, we see it call the Pearl to shore. For the first few scenes with Jack Sparrow, we don't know anything about who he is or what he has to do with anything. It's only after the pirates invade and come across him in a jail cell that we learn that he used to be their captain. And we know next to nothing about how the curse works until the famous scene with Elizabeth and Barbosa explaining it, nearly an hour into the movie. It separates the exposition out so there's never a scene that feels like an info dump. The second thing it does well is a classic screenwriting trick. Whenever a scene contains exposition, it's always mixed in with something else. That way you're never bored. The best example is during the reveal of the skeleton pirates. Barbosa spends several minutes explaining all the details of how the curse works. They can't die, they can't eat or drink, but they're always thirsty and parched, they're in near constant physical pain, and even though they look normal for most of the day, the moonlight reveals their true form. I feel nothing. Not the wind on my face, nor the spray of the sea, nor the warmth of a woman's flesh. 
That's a lot of detail to get through, but far from being a boring scene, this is one of the most memorable moments of the movie. Why? Because first of all, Barbosa is explaining it in his awesome, grandiose, intense pirate speak. And second, while he's talking, we're watching in horror as the movie gives us our first good look at the skeleton pirates. How could we be bored when all this is going on? For another example, we learn that Will's father was a member of Jack's pirate crew at the same time that Will does. Besides exposition, this is also an important character moment, as Will grapples with the knowledge that the father that he idolized for so long was actually a pirate, the thing Will hates most in the world. He was a bloody pirate, a scallywag. My father was not a pirate. Then later, when we learn about how Bill stood up for Jack and got himself thrown overboard, it's an emotional catharsis as we and Will come to realize that even though he was a pirate, Bootstrap Bill Turner was also a good man. He said it wasn't right with the code. That's why he sent off a piece of the treasure to you, as it were. He said we deserve to be cursed. But the third and most important trick that the script uses to deliver exposition is to invert it. Raise a question, and then have the answer to that question be an important piece of exposition. This is the best tip I have in my arsenal of writing advice. If you're an aspiring writer, do this. Please do this. Instead of dropping information in the audience's laps and saying, Remember this, it'll be important later, I promise. Begin with some kind of unexplained detail that catches the audience's eye and gets them wanting to know more, so that by the time you give them the exposition that explains it, they'll eat it up. The best example of this in Curse of the Black Pearl, I think, is the moment between Jack and his old crewmate. So there is a curse. This one shot, paired with this one short line from Jack, is enough to send the audience's mind buzzing with questions. What is this curse? How did the pirates get it? What does it do exactly besides give them the skeleton hands? Then after nearly half an hour of runtime, when Barbosa explains the curse, instead of feeling like you're being lectured to, you're excited to have your questions answered. It's brilliant and I wish more writers understood just how well this works. Everything about this movie feels intentional. Everything is tightly written and designed to squeeze maximum efficiency out of two hour runtime. It's the best version of a Hollywood blockbuster. But that's not exactly helpful for our purposes, is it? Nothing I've described so far is unique to the Pirates franchise. All of it is just good advice for writing any blockbuster. It's not like I can go to the writer of Pirate 6 and tell them, oh, just write good. That's not helpful. It's not like the people who made the sequels don't know how a movie script works. In fact, for at least 2 and 3, it was the same guys making it. There has to be a reason why it was so hard to replicate what made the first movie great. And I'm not just going to throw up my hands and say that the first movie was lightning in a bottle that can't be replicated. I'm also not going to harp on about how the first movie told a self-contained story that's really hard to open back up again for any sequel. Those are both cop-outs. That's not good enough! I want to meet this franchise halfway. I want to pick apart each movie in the series and determine based on their successes and failures what the next movie could do to go from mediocre to great. So let's move on to analyzing those sequels. Which of them are good and which of them are bad? Which elements of the first movie failed to translate in each one? Are there any elements of the sequels that have done better than in the first movie? And most importantly, after five movies, what story threads are left to explore in a potential sixth movie? First, Dead Man's Chest. Is this movie any good? I'd say so. I like it a lot. It's not as good as the first, but it definitely captures plenty of that fun adventure it's pirate spirit. And I think that's the prevailing opinion on this one. Reviews for it are generally positive. But even here, we can see the beginnings of issues that would only get worse as the series went on. It's here that I finally address what's probably the biggest challenge to writing a Pirates movie. The Jack Sparrow problem. In Curse of the Black Pearl, Jack Sparrow is not the protagonist. Will is. Will is the one with a character arc. Will is the one with the most at stake. The story revolves around him and the choices he makes. Jack Sparrow is the most memorable character, but from a writing standpoint, He's a supporting character. He doesn't grow or change much, and we barely even get to learn anything about what's going on inside his head. To be more specific, he's really more like a mentor character. His role in the story is to serve as a foil for Will. Heh, <laughs> foil. Sword puns. He's a pirate, and through a combination of actions that are both noble, selfish, and somewhere in between, he teaches Will the benefits of acting like a pirate. You cheated. Pirate. His actions push Will to grow from a rule follower who hates pirates into someone willing to bend the rules to do what's right. That all works great in Curse of the Black Pearl. 
but when that movie came out and Jack Sparrow was the breakout character, any sequel had to have more Jack Sparrow in it. So in all subsequent sequels, Jack is the protagonist. Why is that such a problem? I think this discussion from Patrick H. Willems about movie trilogies begins to scratch at why this is so impossible. You see, Pirates has the same problem that befalls many trilogies. The internal stakes have already been resolved in an earlier movie, so there's nowhere left to go. Jack Sparrow's internal stakes were all wrapped up in the first movie. And then in the sequels, he is elevated to a more central role in the story, but also he has no internal stakes. His entire story across the second and third movies is fighting Davy Jones for his own survival. I'd like to take that diagnosis a few steps further. I actually think he was being pretty generous when talking about the first movie there. Because what were Jack Sparrow's internal stakes in that first movie exactly? His stakes are primarily external, with his goal of getting the pearl back. Trying to parse his motivations beyond that is really, really hard. His actions and dialogue are constantly confusing and contradictory. Whose side is Jack on? At the moment. This is a character who is defined by his detached, relaxed, uncaring attitude toward everything that happens to him. When you take a character like that and put him in the center of a story, where he has to have a character arc, that's a recipe for disappointment. And all that is on top of the fact that all the best parts of Jack Sparrow were improvised by Johnny Depp in the first movie. Trying to sit down and write a character to be like that is next to impossible. So even in the smaller moments of downtime and comic relief, there are a lot of moments of Dead Man's Chest where the charm of Jack Sparrow falls flat. If he were telling the truth, he wouldn't have told us. Unless, of course, he knew you wouldn't believe the truth, even if he told it to you. So what purpose would be served in finding whatever need be unlocked, which we don't have, without first having found the key what unlocks it? So, we're going after this key! You're not making any sense at all. I don't really mean to criticize the filmmakers here. They did the best they could, but they were kind of backed into a corner. The fans of the studio wanted more Jack Sparrow, so they did their best to give people more Jack Sparrow. Even after everything I listed, the Jack in this movie works more often than he doesn't. Besides, it's not like they could make another movie with Will and Elizabeth as protagonists. The question about internal stakes being wrapped up in the first movie? That's especially true for these two. Will and Elizabeth have both learned that living life outside societal expectations, living like a pirate, is the way to go. And they also confess their feelings for each other. There was nowhere for them to go in a second movie. My least favorite part about movies 2 and 3 is how they do that thing that so many sequels do where they make the couple who got together in the first movie have a fight for no reason and spend the whole movie mad at each other because the story has to have conflict. And on top of that, they made it into a love triangle where Elizabeth has feelings for Jack too, which is just stupid. Those two characters have zero romantic chemistry. Besides the dumb romance stuff, Will and Elizabeth only really come up against external stakes, in that they're fighting to keep each other alive and out of jail, and in Will's case, save his father from Davy Jones. Anyway, the Jack Sparrow problem is easily the number one issue to consider when thinking about making a pirate sequel. He's the face of the franchise, and people expect to see him in a central role, but he's a character whose very conception resists taking a central role. It's a problem that began in Dead Man's Chest and continues all the way through every other sequel. But enough criticizing Dead Man's Chest. What does it do well? The first thing that comes to mind for me is its villain, Davy Jones. To anybody who insists that only the first movie was good and that all the sequels were bad, I have to point to this guy. He, he's just awesome, guys. It's hard to top Barbosa when it comes to Pirates villains, but I'd say he comes pretty darn close. You know, this is the second movie in a row where the villains are undead pirates sailing on a creepy ghost ship, and somehow Davy Jones and the Flying Dutchman still feels new and exciting. He looks awesome, thanks to some really inspired CGI, and Bill Nye's performance really shines through, communicating lots of complex emotions under all those tentacles. He is the best thing about this movie. As the channel Savage Books points out, this guy feels like he's been ripped straight out of a real sailor's ghost story, despite almost everything about him being a completely original creation. But who would this new tentacle-faced captain be? Why not Davy Jones? What ship would he captain? Why not the Flying Dutchman? What would be his secret weapon? Why not the Kraken? Now, if it sounds like these ideas are only tangentially tied together by the word ocean, that's because they are. This is all to say that many of the most alluring aspects of Davy Jones in the films, the parts that seemed most integral and organic to his character, were just random choices that the writing promptification of the first movie allowed to happen. Besides that, I think this movie has the best action set pieces in the series. 
with the hanging cages and the sword fight on the water wheel. And the many different factions, all chasing after the titular dead man's chest, makes for some really fun interplay between all kinds of different characters. In short, I like dead man's chest a lot. The problem though is that it's almost impossible to judge on its own terms. Because it's way too intricately linked with the third movie, At World's End. It's really hard to recommend Dead Man's Chest, no matter how good you think it is, because it ends at a cliffhanger and you have to watch At World's End if you want it resolved. And that movie is a much harder sell. Even though Davy Jones stands in a bucket. First, let's get the obvious out of the way. The thing that everyone knocks this movie for. It's too long, and it's too convoluted. Now, calling a movie long isn't necessarily a criticism. Avengers Endgame, for example, is longer than this, and nobody complained about that. Come to think of it, this movie has a lot in common with Avengers Endgame. They're both essentially part twos of previous movies that ended on cliffhangers, and they both serve as huge, spectacle-filled big finishes to a longer overarching story. But the difference is that Endgame was full of conclusions to the arcs of dozens of beloved characters, whereas the writers were already struggling to find things for Jack and Will and Elizabeth to do after only the first movie. Audiences just weren't invested enough in these characters or the story to sit through nearly three hours of this. Let's talk about how the idea that this movie is convoluted, because convoluted can refer to a number of different aspects. I found one strong point about this movie's failures from CinemaSins of all places. Now, CinemaSins isn't what I would call nuanced and fair analysis, but in their video on At World's End, they made an insightful complaint that stuck out to me. Also, listen, Disney, the supernatural bullshit was not what people enjoyed about the first Pirates movie. It was the zany, swashbuckling fun. So tripling down on the supernatural bullshit was a dumb idea. This might be the most conspicuous difference between the first movie and the next two. Curse of the Black Pearl had a supernatural element in the Cursed Skeleton Pirates, but compared to what came later, they were a relatively small presence. The Curse was more of an excuse to do fun and creative action scenes than anything else. Dead Man's Chest and At World's End open up the world of these movies a lot more, and tell a story that's deeply tied to complicated supernatural lore. And yeah, that makes these two sequels way less fun in pretty much every way. Most people just didn't care about all this mythology. Sometimes keeping up with the plot of these movies feels like homework. Like you have to take notes to keep track of it all. And not in the good way like when you're watching a mystery box show. You constantly have to remind yourself, wait how does this particular curse work? Whose side is this character on? What are the stakes of the character's fail in this scene? And anytime you don't remember the answer, it actively impedes your ability to get emotionally invested in the plot and characters. Plus, the amount of time this movie dedicates to standing around explaining things cuts into the time we could be spending watching crazy swashbuckling sword fights, because these movies aren't nearly as efficient at delivering exposition as Curse of the Black Pearl was. This issue was present in Dead Man's Chest, but it was manageable. In At World's End, though, it collapses in on itself. As examples, I'm going to list my three least favorite parts of this movie. Number one, the Brethren Court. The whole fun of stories about pirates is that they thumb their nose at rules and live crazy independent lives of freedom and adventure. But suddenly, here, we have to sit through a council of pirate politicians making decisions that govern all of piratedom. Sure, it's full of wacky characters and silly bickering to keep your attention, but the very idea of it is counter to the idea of what pirates are, both in our cultural imaginations and in this franchise. What would you rather watch? This? Or this? Number two, the sheer amount of times the characters betray each other and switch sides. Treachery and double crossing is fine up to a point, and it worked pretty well in the first two movies, but there are about a dozen major characters, all with differing agendas, and most of whom betray an ally at least once. With so much disloyalty flying around, keeping up with every character's position on this chessboard of a plot feels like a chore. Instead of being thrilled when someone reveals their betrayal, instead of feeling shocked and excited, my reaction most of the time was, uh, okay. She's not part of the bargain. What bargain be that? The perfidious rotter led a mutiny against us. I need the pearl to free my father. That's the only reason I came on this voyage. You agreed. The black pearl was to be mine. And so it was. <laughs> Beckett agreed. The black pearl was to be mine. Lord Beckett's not going to give up the only ship as can outrun the Dutchman, is he? Number three, Calypso. This one I really can't understand. A huge part of this movie revolves around the imprisoning of the sea goddess Calypso in the human form of Tia Dalma. The one good part relating to her is how she humanizes Davy Jones. The explanation that Davy Jones was once a good man who fell in love with her, and then turned angry and bitter as a result of their falling out, makes him a better villain. But besides that, the movie spends a staggering amount of time on her with no payoff. 
It spends lots of time explaining how and why the previous meeting of the Brethren Court bound her into human form, and an equal amount of time showing Barbosa trying to convince the other pirates to unbind her. Even after seeing this movie multiple times, I still haven't been able to fully grasp why the Brethren Court did either of those things in the first place. And then, before the final battle, they unbind her, and she turns into a bunch of crabs and disappears. And that's it! That's all! She doesn't do anything after that, except, I guess, make it rain? She has no meaningful impact on the plot at all. Why? Why was she given so much screen time? If I could make only one change to the script, I would find a way to cut her out. This is what people are talking about when they call this movie convoluted. It's not that being complicated is bad, but the complications to this story don't add enough to justify their existence. Especially when the majority of the audience came in with a below average patience for that sort of thing. So Outworld's End gets pretty unwieldy, and the way it got wrapped up in its own mythology alienated a sizable chunk of its audience. Still though, this movie has its fans. In looking through people's opinions about these movies, I found a surprising number of people saying they prefer it to Curse of the Black Pearl. Here's a point from the channel The Flick Fix Show. I believe that this happened because of the dissonance between what the audience wanted and what the films were actually giving them. I believe that the most audiences wanted this series to be a series of standalone adventures that took place in this universe with these characters. Something like Indiana Jones, but instead what they got with this complex overarching narrative that went from one film to another. And in the end, I just don't think audiences cared. Which is a bit of a shame, because I think the third Pirates of the Caribbean movie has a lot to offer. You just have to kind of take it for what it is. There's a lot I don't like about Outworld's End. But I wouldn't blame most of what I didn't like on the incompetence of the writers and filmmakers. Making this movie into a sprawling and complex epic was an intentional choice. A lot of people didn't want such an involved narrative, but if you do want that, for the most part, this movie will work for you. And also, let's say you're part of that first group. You think the story is messy and convoluted and you just don't care. Well, you can still enjoy the look and the aesthetic of this movie, because it looks beautiful. The action scenes, though spread further apart than we would have liked, are still cool. The set design and CGI still look amazing. Watching through this entire movie in one three-hour sitting can get tedious and exhausting, but whenever I go back and look at individual clips, I'm like, whoa, look at that. The channel Too Many Tapes points out how these movies have a certain intentionality to their cinematography that not a lot of movies made more recently have. Look at the top 10 highest grossing live action films of the 2010s. Not a one of them has cinematography that you could describe as anything but fine. We're not getting a lot of Hollywood movies with $100 million plus budgets taking big swings at a capital L look. This trilogy of movies has the most distinct look and feel of any blockbuster in recent memory, I think. From the sets, to the costumes, to the editing, to the soundtrack. God, do I love the soundtrack to these things. Hans Zimmer is a genius. Play just enough of it without getting a copyright strike. Again, I don't know a whole lot about cinematography, so there's not a ton I can do to analyze it. I'll point you to that Too Many Tapes video if you want someone to dig into that. But all of this elevates Pirates 2 and 3 to a level that makes it more than just its script. And also, Davy Jones stands in a bucket. But let's wrap back around and get back to the main topic of this whole discussion, making more sequels. Because independent of whether Outworld's End is good or bad, this is a movie that's really hard to follow up. In every way, this movie feels like a finale. It's a story that encompasses such a massive scale that brings together every single character of the series and wraps up all their stories. And on top of that, a major theme of the film is how the old world is dying and how pirates will never rule the seas in the same way again. The ending of this movie leaves any future installments in a tight spot, because all the characters are out of stuff to do. In particular, Will and Elizabeth. I mentioned how they don't really have anywhere to go after the first movie, but now they really don't have anywhere to go. They finished being mad at each other at the end, finally, and got married. And with Will as the captain of the Flying Dutchman and Elizabeth as a pirate queen, they've triply completed their shift from polite society to the swashbuckling world of pirates. They're done. They can't carry a movie's worth of story anymore. Also, the Jack Sparrow problem is becoming more and more conspicuous. In putting him in such a central role for two movies, the series essentially destroyed the mystique of the character. At World's End digs into his backstory some more in an attempt to make him more humanized, more relatable. We learn that the reason he became a pirate was because he used to work for the British Navy. But instead of transporting a boat full of slaves as he was ordered, he set them free, making him an outlaw. I contracted you to deliver cargo on my behalf. You chose to liberate it. People aren't cargo, mate. This was most likely written as an attempt to make him more heroic, give him characteristics more befitting of a leading man. 
I keep saying it, but the central reason why he worked in the first movie was that the audience didn't ever fully know what he was thinking or feeling. Dead Man's Chest and At World's End are full of moments like this that give us way too much information about how he got to be where he is and what's going on inside his head. The biggest of which is introducing Jack's father, played by Keith Richards. Besides the common complaint that casting the guy that Johnny Depp bases performance off of gives us too much of a peek behind the curtain, I don't want to think about Jack Sparrow's dad. As soon as you introduce the character's parents, it makes them feel way less independent and cool. That's the whole reason why teenagers don't want their parents around when their friends come over. This and so many other little moments across these movies cause Jack Sparrow to become demythologized. After this, he's nowhere near as fun to watch as he used to be, and he can never be as fun again. At World's End burned through every last scrap of story this franchise had, probably because the filmmakers assumed this would be the last one. But as we all know, it wasn't the last one. So where to go in a fourth movie? The filmmakers are kind of stuck in a bind. The channel Captain Midnight nails this problem pretty well. In the end, I feel like Pirates of the Caribbean's biggest strength kind of turned into the thing that crippled the series. Jack Sparrow. The Pirates of the Caribbean franchise could have been a great ensemble series with a stable of memorable characters, but it settled for being the Jack Sparrow show, and now it's struggling to be seen as anything else. If only movies 2 and 3 had introduced some more new characters who were capable of carrying a story later. But instead, the trilogy focused mostly on just their three original leads, Will, Elizabeth, and Jack. Will and Elizabeth have to be done after this. And Jack, even though he's not a character who can ever really feel finished, is a shell of his former self. So in the fourth movie, the writers pretty much had no other choice than to make it into a Jack Sparrow solo adventure, since he's the face of the franchise and the only character of consequence left. And so, we come to movie number four, On Stranger Tides. Here's where we get to the point where the opinion of these movies dips into overwhelmingly negative. But I get where the filmmakers were coming from with this one. The first three movies finished the overarching story and didn't really leave anything to explore next. So they pivoted. They tried their hand at making the series work like Indiana Jones or James Bond, where this movie and any future ones are mostly self-contained standalone adventures of Jack Sparrow. It's a sound idea in theory. Except that the audience, whoever stuck around long enough to get to movie 4 anyway, now expects something more grand and epic. So instead, most people felt that On Stranger Tides was weaker, that it felt pointless. The channel Filmento points out that throughout the whole story, Jack Sparrow feels weirdly out of place in his own movie. It's an entirely separate film that snatched Jack Sparrow up into being in it against his will and then slapped the name Pirates of the Caribbean on the cover. And if you think I'm exaggerating, the first act ends with Jack literally being drugged and dragged along onto the quest of finding the fountain. And yeah. Both in-universe and out-of-universe, Jack Sparrow shouldn't have anything to do with this story. That thing about slapping Jack Sparrow and Pirates of the Caribbean onto a completely separate story? That's pretty much exactly what happened. On Stranger Tides is the name of a pirate adventure novel by Tim Powers, about a guy named Jack Shandy who joins Blackbeard's crew on a search for the Fountain of Youth. I did read that book out of curiosity. Didn't really love it. This movie takes that premise of Blackbeard and the Fountain of Youth and loosely adapts it while also throwing Jack Sparrow in there. In previous movies, the writing suffered because Jack was a character with no internal stakes. But in this movie, he doesn't have any external stakes either. As well as having no character arc and no inner turmoil, he also has no investment in the Fountain of Youth at all. He doesn't even want to be there. The lead character of the movie has no interest in anything that's going on. That alone makes the movie so fundamentally broken that nothing else it did well would ever allow it to work. But just to be thorough, let's go through all the other reasons why this movie doesn't work so that we can glean more information on what a future sequel should avoid. There's the subplot with the priest guy and the mermaid girl. This has been done to death, but these characters are so unbelievably bland. This movie never gives us any reason to care about them. The thing everyone always says about these two is that they're the discount replacements for Will and Elizabeth. But I think that comparison is actually pretty off base. Yes, they fulfill the role of hot white people who are in love, but these two are not, nor were they ever meant to be, lead roles of the same level of importance as Will and Elizabeth. They're a background subplot at best. Now, the quote-unquote replacement lead for Will and Elizabeth is really Penelope Cruz as Angelica. She at least has some stake in the plot, what with her trying to find the fountain to save her dad Blackbeard. But her primary purpose in the story is to be a love interest for Jack, which is such a fundamentally terrible idea. Jack Sparrow is not a man anyone could imagine settling down with someone. After seeing the way he treats so many women throughout the series, the fact that this movie tries to convince us that he and Angelica could possibly be a good match is laughable. Blackbeard is an okay villain, but the inclusion of a real-life pirate in the story kind of rubbed me the wrong way. 
I guess is that this series has always been a crazy pirate fantasy adventure, and tying it back to real world history disrupts that for me. I don't know. And Barboso is still kicking around, I guess, but like Jack, he also feels pretty shoehorned in, with a pretty flimsy reason for him to want the fountain. Besides the weird writing and character motivations, everything about this movie feels small and cheap, at least compared to the last movie's bombastic and spectacular visuals. Without Gore Verbinski at the helm, something was lost here. New director Rob Marshall couldn't capture the same majesty and high-flying fun. In their video, Filmento describes the scene in King George's Palace as the high point of the movie. Here, Jack is chained up, but over the course of a conversation, Jack carefully sets up a series of dominoes, and at the end, he sets them off to pull off his escape. This sounds like it could have been a stunt by the Jack from the first movie that we know and love. And it's great, on paper. But when I watch that scene, instead of going, Wow, Jack is so awesome, I'm thinking... Re really? You can't just hit him? Shoot! Shoot! There are like 20 guys in there, why is no one grabbing him? They're all just standing there... Really? That, just, that guy just got knocked over by a plate of food. Okay, where did everyone go all of a sudden? Oh, they're just standing around. Okay. Only one guy is gonna... Uh, uh, okay. Don't they all have guns? Nobody is shooting him. They're just staring at him. Why are they not shooting him? In any action movie, characters are going to perform unbelievable stunts to get out of danger. But the magic of movies is that they have a number of tricks under their belt to make the impossible seem possible. I don't see any of that on display here. The scene needed some clever editing to disguise how little the people in the room are doing to stop Jack. Instead of focusing on Jack's cool stunts, all I could think about was how he only got away because everyone else in the scene was being a complete idiot. However weak the story was, this movie could have skated by holding onto the franchise's cool and unique filmmaking style. But unfortunately, that's gone too. All of these problems contribute to this feeling more like a cheap knockoff than a continuation of what came before. I hereby commute your sentence and order that you be imprisoned for the remainder of your miserable, moribund, mutton shop life. Finally, we get to the fifth movie, Dead Men Tell No Tales. This movie was definitely an attempt to course correct. The filmmakers realized that the Jack Sparrow standalone solo adventure thing wasn't going to work after On Stranger Tides was panned. So they went back to their roots. They reached back and found a way to tie the story back to Will, Elizabeth, and Davy Jones. They introduced new male and female leads in Henry and Karina to be actual replacements for Will and Elizabeth. They even reined in Jack Sparrow and put him into more of a supporting role. The premise of Henry and Jack teaming up because Henry is trying to break his father's curse and Jack is trying to get away from Captain Salazar is identical to what Will and Jack did in the first movie. On paper, this did everything right, and it looks like a real return to form but it wasn't. I think it's marginally better than On Stranger Ties, I'll give it that. But this was not the return to form that we hoped it would be. Henry and Karina are fine. I mean, they have some good lines and good scenes here and there. I think Karina is somewhat more interesting than Henry is. But I didn't remember either of their names after the first pass, which isn't great. Also, having Karina be Barossa's daughter was pretty dumb. I think Javier Bardem is generally an awesome actor. But as Captain Salazar here, he just felt like another worse version of the cursed undead captain that we've already seen done twice. And Jack felt off in this movie. And I mean more so than usual. I'll let Filmento explain that one. With Jack Sparrow, truth is different from what you see. He's smart, he's capable, his intelligence, wit, charisma and confidence all mixed together. One of the greatest pirates in existence, a genius disguised as a fool. In Dead Men Tell No Tales, however, he's just a fool. This time, all he does is kind of aimlessly bounce around like a drunk Mr. Magoo and just name things in front of him. Bridge. To put it another way, in the previous movies, Jack was Bugs Bunny. But here, he's Jar Jar Binks. Instead of making impossible escapes by the seat of his pants through sheer wit, he bumbles through every scene and survives by sheer dumb luck. This gross mischaracterization is a huge part of what makes this film feel hollow. Plus, they continue with the whole trend of demystifying Jack with that one scene that flashes back to him as a boy, with weird de-aging CGI, and complete with a dumb origin story for his last name, a la Han Solo. You stood there looking like, like a little bird, eh? Got this bad, bro. The other big problem I can see with this movie's script is its main MacGuffin, the Trident of Poseidon. It can supposedly break any curse, and all kinds of characters are chasing after it for various curse-breaking related reasons. 
that culminates with what I think is by far the stupidest moment in the entire franchise to date. It's not just me, right, that felt totally random? This series is no stranger to magical MacGuffins, but this one felt different, noticeably weaker. I think Jenny Nicholson pinpointed the reason why in her video The Cursed Half-Life of the Pirates franchise. A plus wordplay in that title, by the way. I think it's a great idea to add mysticism to your pirate universe, because like sailors are very superstitious folk, and there are a lot of famous pirate legends that you can work in. But if each quest has to be about a separate, new, super powerful magical object, then things are gonna start running into each other really fast. So now in this movie, they have to get Poseidon's trident to break all the curses of the sea. The concept is appealing to me because it implies that they're kind of trying to like, just wipe the slate clean and get rid of all this random magic stuff they made so far. But, but like, wait, does this mean that the Greek god Poseidon existed in this universe? Are the other Greek gods real too? Wait, didn't the voodoo lady grow to be 20 feet tall because it turned out she was a goddess of the sea also? How many are there? At World's End already opened up this world as widely as it gets. We've seen so many gigantic, universe-shaking supernatural stuff that adding in another one feels cheap and contradictory. It's old hat. And, like on Stranger Tides, this movie also lacks the sense of style and polish that the first trilogy of movies had, in both visuals and writing. No woman's ever handled my Herschel. Comedy gold. Besides being another Pirates movie not directed by Gore Verbinski, this is also the first movie not written by screenwriters Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio. Even more of that spark that the franchise started with feels gone from this one because of it. In the end, the difference between this and the first few movies is a lot like the difference between The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit movies. On the surface, they're part of the same series hitting a lot of the same beats, but one feels like it was put together with passion and care by a filmmaker with a sense of style, and the other feels like a bunch of those elements randomly mashed together in an infinitely worse way. The last thing I want to talk about is where this movie leaves off, because presumably with a sixth movie, it would need to pick up where this one left off. Jack ends the movie without really having changed at all, basically in the same position he was when he started. Barbosa is dead, for the second time, having sacrificed himself for his daughter. Henry and Karina did what they set out to do, but I wouldn't describe them as having concluded satisfying character arcs the way Will and Elizabeth did in the first movie. In fact, I'm not even sure I could pinpoint what their character arcs were, which isn't great. And then there's the post credit scene. So Henry freed his father from his curse, which means he can return to land and reunite with his family. The last shot of the movie is Will and Elizabeth asleep in bed, when Will has a flash of Davy Jones returning. Which may or may not have been a dream, but we all know it's not. This seemingly teases Davy Jones' return in a future movie. Okay, now after having gone through all of that, let's answer the question. Which of these movies are good and which of them are bad? At what point did the Pirates franchise lose its way? Well, um, I have a confession to make. I like all of them. I don't think that all of them are well written or well made, but no matter how dumb or contrived or convoluted the writing gets, I can always find some entertainment value in what's happening on screen. All five movies have that signature pirate aesthetic, and plenty of weird ridiculous action to hold my attention. I can watch Jack Sparrow cut a rope and ride it up a thousand times and it never gets old. To me, even the worst Pirates movie is still better than most modern action blockbusters. The movies have definitely gotten worse, but they haven't completely lost the spark of what I love about them. That's what gives me hope for a sequel that turns things around, because no matter how many times people knock the later sequels and complain that the series has gone downhill, people are still turning up in droves to see these things. People still want to see these wacky pirate adventures on the big screen. That's also how I know we'll be getting a new one someday. Making one is guaranteed to make Disney some money. Now, finally, we've arrived at the question that started this video. How do you make a sixth Pirates movie that's good? Well, as you've probably figured out by now, the question is way more complicated than just telling them to get better writing. The very idea of a new sequel is one defined by paradoxes. To write a new Pirates movie, you have to balance both what makes for the best story and fan expectations of what the franchise is supposed to be. You have to deal with a main character of the franchise that fundamentally doesn't work as a main character. 
You have to decide how much bad stuff from previous movies you can get away with ignoring, and how much of it that you're stuck with. You have to add to a story that already ended twice. You can't make it a loose standalone, but you also can't tie it back to old canon, apparently. You have to do something to convince people who have written off the series years ago that it's worth revisiting. And on top of all of that, you might even have to do all of it without Jack Sparrow in it. I will never set foot in this town again, sir. Yeah, so all this time I've been ignoring a pretty big elephant in the room. And that's that there's a very real possibility that Johnny Depp will never be able to play Jack Sparrow again. Over the last few years, he's been going through a huge entanglement of personal and legal issues regarding his divorce with Amber Heard. It's a huge mess. I've read up on what happened as much as I can, and I've still had a really hard time understanding it all. But the fact remains that a sizable chunk of fans and members of Hollywood want him out of the franchise. He's already been recast in the Fantastic Beast movies. Which, side note, the instant I saw Mads Mikkelsen in the trailer for Secrets of Dumbledore, I was like, oh he's a way better Grindelwald, he should've been in that role from the beginning. There's been nothing confirmed about whether Disney would bring Johnny Depp back to play Jack Sparrow again, but it's looking pretty unlikely. Which would seem like a new movie as a non-starter. Jack Sparrow has been what drove the series. Can there still be Pirates of the Caribbean without Jack Sparrow? I'm sure you can imagine that if I thought the answer was no, I wouldn't have made this video. There is more to this franchise than just Jack. But if the sixth movie is going to move on without him, it needs to be extra sure that it captures the spirit and the identity of the series to date. What makes the identity of this franchise? What is part of the integral DNA of these movies? What absolutely has to be there for it to count as a Pirates movie? Well, there's one specific element to this series that's more important than anything else. It has to do with the way it portrays pirates. Specifically, it's a focus on an idealized fantasy of piracy. I haven't really brought this up yet, but in real life history, pirates were terrible people. They were robbers and murderers, not people to be idolizing. But pop culture has done a funny thing to pirates over the years. In pirate fiction, they tend to be a lot more sympathetic, but in a very specific way and for a specific reason. I watched this docu-series on Netflix not too long ago about the history of pirates called The Lost Pirate Kingdom. And over the course of six episodes, it features this scene no less than three times. They liberate slaves. You are no longer slaves! You are now subject to the laws of piracy! By the third time I saw it, I was like, wow, they really want me to associate pirates with freeing slaves, don't they? The golden age of piracy in the early 1700s occurred at a point in history that we have a very strained relationship with. This was a time where European powers were exerting their might all across the world, where colonization and imperialism ran unchecked. Organizations like the British and Spanish empires and the East India Company hurt a lot of people. And today, most people recognize that as a bad thing. Pirates from this time weren't any more moral than the colonial powers were. They hurt a lot of people too. But since they were positioned as enemies of the colonial powers, we like to assign them the role of the good guy against the evil oppressive colonizers. In our pirate fiction, pirates aren't thieves and murderers. They're positioned as righteous rebels who stick it to the man by defying the powers that be. The Pirates of the Caribbean movies are no exception. No matter how crazy the supernatural forces get, the British Navy is always an antagonist in some form. The stories always feature some element of slobs versus snobs, with Jack and the other pirate characters making complete fools out of stuffy British soldiers. Will and Elizabeth's descent into piracy is framed as them throwing off the shackles of oppressive societal norms and entering a life where they're free to live how they want. That's what's been at the core of this series from the very beginning. This is what people want from stories about pirates. A pirate's movie needs to embody that sense of freedom that the idea of a pirate evokes. The audience needs to see cool pirates sticking it to the man. Nothing else is more important to the identity and success of the Pirates franchise, not even Jack Sparrow. Besides that, there are a handful of things that can help spiritually tie this movie to what came before. The balance of historical pirate stuff with supernatural elements. The constant threat of betrayal between the many morally grey characters. Some absolutely gonzo action set pieces. A handful of running gags like why is the rum always gone and this shot. The occasional reference to the original ride, because in case you forgot, all of this came out of a freaking 16 minute theme park ride. And of course, the Hans Zimmer soundtrack. That music might be the one thing that stayed just as good across every movie. Play just enough of it without getting a copyright strike. Other than that, the last thing this movie has to nail for it to feel like a Pirates movie is the tone. See, these movies ride a very fine line between silly and serious, as the channel Robert's Thoughts points out. The movies are able to get away with all of this because they take themselves very seriously. 
Yes, they're silly, slapstick, over-the-top, and funny, but they're unapologetically so. They aren't afraid to be exactly what they are, as opposed to something like the MCU, where everything seems tongue-in-cheek and aware of the overall silliness. A lot of present-day blockbusters, especially ones with outlandish and silly genre premises, try to keep an ironic detachment from everything happening in the story. A lot of times it gives off the sense that the filmmakers are embarrassed of what they made. Like they're lampshading and saying, We know this is stupid, sorry. Okay, look, the city is flying. We're fighting an army of robots. And I have a bow and arrow. None of this makes sense. And that attitude keeps the audience from fully investing in the story. Sometimes that can be a good thing. But that kind of tone would never work in a Pirates movie. Acknowledging the silliness breaks the immersion. The fantastical world of Pirates in the High Seas draws you in because everything about the characters and the framing treats this like life and death. That way, even in the more ridiculous moments, like when Davy Jones stands in a bucket, the scene is still emotionally gripping. This is something that Dead Men Tell No Tales messed up a bit. Any future sequel has to understand this. So if the sixth movie nails all of what I listed, it can survive the absence of Jack Sparrow. But theme, tone, those are pretty nebulous. Let's dig into the nitty gritty. Here's what might be the biggest hurdle to a new pirate sequel. Even if the movie itself is good, there are a ton of people who straight up won't see it because they think the franchise is all washed up. Heh, <laughs> washed up. Ocean puns. The series has its diehard fans, but for general audiences, a new movie has to convince them that it'll be different from the bad sequels that came before. And those differences have to be immediately obvious, right from the trailer. I think that the single biggest thing that the series can do to show they mean business is to hire a big name director. Like I've been saying, a lot of the franchise's success comes from the unique style and vision of Gore Verbinski in those first three movies. Even though Verbinski isn't really a household name, most people can recognize that the earlier movies feel like they have a lot more care put into them than most blockbusters these days. Personally, I'd be really happy if he came back to direct a new one. But to reach a wider audience, this new movie needs a more famous name to get a buzz going. I'm talking about something similar to James Gunn taking over the Suicide Squad sequel, and outdoing the previous Suicide Squad movie in every way. Or how everyone got excited to see Sam Raimi's name in the trailer for Doctor Strange 2, as people got excited for him to bring his artistic touch to a series that always made directors feel interchangeable. It doesn't have to be someone as famous as Christopher Nolan, just enough to perk people's attention, enough to think, hey, this one might be good this time. Since I mentioned them, I think Sam Raimi or James Gunn would be great choices to direct a Pirates movie. Both of them do a great job of balancing campiness with genuine emotional storytelling that a Pirates movie needs. But if I had to pick anybody, I'd go with Robert Rodriguez. Now, Robert Rodriguez isn't quite as famous as the others I've mentioned. Maybe you've never heard of him, but you've probably heard of some of his movies. Among my generation, he's best known for making the Spy Kids movies and Sharkboy and Lava Girl. He's also known for his collaborations with Quentin Tarantino. And there's no doubt that this guy has a unique sense of style. He is the master of camp. His movies are cartoonish and over the top, but they always play everything straight. And they're always filled with weird and cool practical effects. In particular, his work on From Dusk Till Dawn is what makes me think his style would work amazingly well in a Pirates movie. He's not the biggest name, but he has a bit of a cult following, and he's big enough to get certain circles of people excited and talking about it online. I'm not married to him as director, there are others who could also do it well, but this is the single biggest thing that this movie can do to restore faith in the general public. After that, the next biggest question to answer is, which characters from previous movies should return? Let's start by addressing Jack Sparrow one more time. We're doing this under the assumption that Johnny Depp won't be returning. But that doesn't mean there will be zero Jack Sparrow in this movie. I'm not saying recast him, definitely not. Johnny Depp is Jack Sparrow. There's no replacing him. But there should definitely be people in this movie talking about him. Telling stories of his deeds and exploits. He's too integral to the series to make a whole movie without even mentioning him. And he could also make a brief cameo where, like, there's a body double with his back to the camera or something, I don't know. If there's no Jack, does that mean no Gibbs? Not necessarily. Gibbs might be Jack's first mate and right hand, but we've seen them operate separately before. I don't think Gibbs should be a major presence or anything, but he can and probably should be in a scene or two. Like, maybe he's hanging out in Tortuga to be the old grizzled sailor that the main characters come to visit for information. This movie should probably skip out on Cotton and Marty, though. If you don't know, Cotton is the guy with the parrot, and Marty is the little guy. Jack has kind of a revolving door of crew members for the Black Pearl across the series, but these two are the only ones besides Gibbs who show up consistently. They're too tied to Jack to bring back, and they're not that important anyway. For the next one, okay, I'm going to address this next part directly at Disney. Look, I know it's tempting, 
I know he's awesome. I know he's a fan favorite. But Disney, listen to me. You cannot bring back Barbosa. I know you're going to want to. Don't. Don't get me wrong. I think reviving him for At World's End was the right call. He was a lot of fun in that movie as a good guy. But ever since, he's been bouncing around aimlessly with nothing to do. He's given us all he can give. And we're trying to make this movie stand out as different from what came before. Besides, he's already died twice, and reviving him again would just make people roll their eyes. You know who should definitely come back, though? Pintle and Rigetti. If you don't recognize those names, I'm talking about these two idiots. Bringing them back is a no-brainer, a layup. They're the only characters in the series with absolutely no baggage. No loyalty to anyone and no deep ties to anyone but each other. They were missing from the last two sequels, and I missed them. They'd be great comic relief as well as important familiar faces. As we keep going though, things get a little trickier. Like for Will and Elizabeth. Should they return? And that also raises another question. Should this movie acknowledge the post credit scene at the end of Dead Men Tell No Tales? On the one hand, I could just say screw it, pretend like it never happened. People probably won't notice or care. But this movie is already on shaky ground as a pirate sequel without Jack Sparrow. And I think it should take its connections to past movies where it can get them, as long as they don't actively impede the current story. It should pick up on some of the threads from Dead Men Tell No Tales. I think Will and Elizabeth should make appearances, but they shouldn't be major characters. Their story has already been resolved and wrapped up three different times. But they can easily make smaller cameos, similar to how Dead Men Tell No Tales did it. Speaking of that post credit scene, though, it teased the return of Davy Jones. Should Davy Jones come back? Actually, yeah, I think he should. Davy Jones was an awesome villain, and Bill Nye keeps saying how he wants to play that character again. Obviously, he couldn't have the Dutchman, the Kraken, or his crew of fish people anymore, but that's a good thing. The movie can take an old character and do something different with him. If we don't have Jack, we don't have Will, we don't have Elizabeth, and we don't have Barbosa, we can still have Davy Jones to provide that critical link to the previous movies. And he's just awesome. I think people will be excited to see him again. Then maybe the toughest question, should Karina and Henry come back? They were introduced in Dead Men Tell No Tales, and most people's reactions to them ranged from indifference to active hatred. But the issue is that, as we've established, this movie won't get off the ground without acknowledging and continuing the stories of previous movies in some way. And completely ignoring these characters, regardless of how bad they were, puts that connection at risk. It's not like On Stranger Tides, which was made to be mostly standalone. I don't think any of those characters should come back. But Henry and Karina are another story. If I were making the call, I'd bring Karina back, but keep Henry to a more minor role. Kaya Scodelario, the actress who plays Karina, has mentioned that she signed a two-movie contract. I wouldn't mind having her back. I liked her a lot more than I liked Henry, and I think her character could work pretty well with better writers handling her. Plus, I think there's more story to tell with her as opposed to Henry whose story ended after he saved his dad. But that doesn't leave us with very much, does it? We have Davy Jones as our antagonist, Karina as a main character, and a whole bunch of tiny mentions and cameos from the old cast. Who else will be in the movie? This is the point where we start bringing in new characters. I think Pirate 6 should be a movie with an ensemble cast, a collection of diverse and creative characters who all come together to face a common enemy. Karina would be one of them, and the rest would be all new faces. Also, I think that any new lead they bring on should be played by a big name actor. Now normally I'm against that kind of thing. I'd like for characters in a script to stand on their own without relying on star power and name recognition. But in this case, I think casting household names with strong personality would be a huge boon. These movies have already tried going with no-names twice and it didn't work either time. Without Johnny Depp, Orlando Bloom, or Keira Knightley, we need performers who can bring their own personal flair to their roles if we want any hope of carrying on without them. But not just any big star. There's a certain kind of star I want to see. There have been persistent rumors that Margot Robbie is set to play a lead role in the next Pirates movie. I think she's a great choice. She's skyrocketed in popularity after playing Harley Quinn. She can absolutely pull off a weird, offbeat pirate character. But crucially, her character in this movie should be distinctly different from Harley Quinn. I cannot stress that enough. We need actors playing characters that feel unique, that feel special to this movie. Anything else would be poison. People are already coming to this under the assumption that this will be a discount bargain in Pirates movie. If Margot Robbie doesn't bring something different and new to the table, her character will just feel like a discount bargain man Harley Quinn, or worse, a discount bargain man Jack Sparrow. This movie also can't cast an actor like The Rock, who these days just kind of plays himself in every movie. It also can't have a Robert Downey Jr. type who's known for starking their way through everything. 
Remember, these movies only work if they play everything straight. And it can't cast someone like Adam Sandler, who's always typecast into the same character in every movie. And definitely don't cast Ryan Reynolds, who is all three of those things. I got that on Etsy. No offense to any of those actors, but what we need are actors who are really willing to transform themselves and do something that stands out. So that even if people bought tickets because they saw the names of celebrities they liked, by the end of the movie it's the characters that they remember. Beyond that, I said I think this should be an ensemble for a reason. I don't think it's a good idea to have one major lead for this movie, because anyone watching will automatically compare them to Jack Sparrow. We need to spread screen time out among more characters, so that one bad performance doesn't sink the movie. Heh, <laughs> sink. Boat puns. I'm thinking four to six people from vastly differing backgrounds who all come together on one pirate ship in the pursuit of a common goal for varying reasons. Each character should have their own unique motivation and a reason to distrust or betray the others. We'd have Margot Robbie as one, probably some kind of more outlandish and wacky pirate. We'd have Karina, and we'd have a couple of others. Maybe a British soldier who defected. Maybe an old sailor who never got to live the life of adventure that he craved. Of those remaining characters, we need at least one of them to be a straight man for the sillier characters to bounce off of, and at least one of them to act like a stereotypical pirate with a hat and accent and everything. Characters who can fill the role of Will and Barbosa respectively, but not in such a one-to-one -one way that they come off like bargain bin versions. And also, Pinto and Rigetti would be in there somewhere. They could join up with the good guys, or they could even wind up working for Davy Jones. That could be fun. With all those pieces in play, I think this movie would be in a great position to soft reboot the franchise, to pass the torch to some new and interesting characters. I'm sure not all of them are going to be great, but that's the beauty of setting up an ensemble. You can pick and choose which ones to focus on in future movies based on how well they work. And it leaves room for an unexpected character to become a breakout favorite. A lot of what made previous sequels so hard to get right is that almost every movie in the series was made without any forethought towards future movies. So I'm trying to ensure that this movie has room to continue its story, if it does well enough to make fans want more. Finally, what would this movie be about? What would the basic premise be? First off, no curses. Besides the fact that it's already been done too many times, the Trident of Poseidon already broke every curse in the world in the last movie. I guess we should start with the question of how and why Davy Jones came back. What's his motivation? Normally, I think it's best to come up with an idea for a story and then create a character around what would be the most interesting person for that story, but hey, I'm working with what we have. The simplest answer would be revenge on Will and Jack, but one, that's boring, and two, that's pretty hard to do if Will and Jack are barely in the movie. There's also his relationship to Calypso, but I don't think there's much of anything left to tell there. And he can't be motivated by protecting his heart since, you know, his heart got stabbed already. It's tough because as cool as he is, he has to have a reason for returning, especially if he's returning to face off against an all-new cast. If it's not done carefully, this can quickly turn into another Rise of Skywalker. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be... unnatural. Hmm. The more I think about it, the more I think Davy Jones shouldn't be the antagonist of this movie. At least, he shouldn't be the main antagonist of this movie. Instead, let's have all the characters worry about him returning, only to find that all he wants to do is be left alone. The audience can be led to think that he's what's causing the story's main conflicts, but he ends up being a red herring. Instead, let's have the bad guy be another stuck-up stooge from the Navy, a Norrington or Beckett type. I'm partial to the idea of the bad guy being a French Navy officer. We've already had plenty of British bad guys and a Spanish bad guy. This would be something a little different. Then we need something supernatural, besides Davy Jones, because it's not a pirate's movie without it. Again, no curses, and also nothing too powerful or world-altering, so as not to contradict previous movies. In Filmento's video on a potential Pirate 6, while well, that guy really loves making videos on these movies, he suggests the Leviathan, which I think is a great idea. The Leviathan can be swimming around, smashing up ships, and generally causing problems all around, leading to a whole host of characters from all over the globe to get wrapped up in the issue of what to do about it. We should take Tortuga. And push it somewhere else! As long as there's something unique about it to distinguish it from the Kraken, I think it would work pretty well. And on top of that, I'd like for one of the good guys to have some kind of magical ability. Nothing huge, just something small to make them stand out. Maybe they're, uh, a Selkie, a mythical creature that can shapeshift between a seal and a human form. Maybe they can just control the weather or something. Just a little something extra. With all these elements working together, and with good artistic guidance from some very talented people, I think this could end up being a really good movie. So here's my pitch. The Leviathan suddenly shows up one day, and starts randomly destroying ships. 
This disrupts sea travel all over the globe, hurting navies and pirates alike. At the same time, Will continues to have visions of Davy Jones returning. Since Poseidon's trident broke every curse, and Davy Jones' death was the direct result of a curse, that brought him back to life. This information travels from Will, to Henry, to Karina, to eventually the rest of the cast, until everyone assumes that Davy Jones is back, and he's found a new pet to replace his beloved Kraken and make everyone's lives miserable. One way or another, our ensemble group of good guys all converge and end up together on a ship bound to hunt down the Leviathan. They all have their own reasons for doing so. One might want to kill the beast for personal glory. One might want revenge because it killed someone they love. One might want to harvest his body parts for profit. Karina probably wants to study it for scientific purposes. And alongside them are French bad guys either chasing down the Leviathan for their own reasons, or chasing down one of our main characters, or both. Anyway, the good guys track down Davy Jones to try and force him to stop the Leviathan. Jones has holed himself away in some remote part of the ocean. Maybe a graveyard of sunken ships to fit with the theme of him never touching land. Also, Pinto and Rigetti work for him, as goofy evil henchmen, serving as a pale shadow of the mighty crew he once commanded. But when the heroes find him, Jones says he has nothing to do with the Leviathan. Tempers flare and they end up fighting Jones just barely escaping. Finally, eventually, our band of pirates tracks the Leviathan down. There's a three-way showdown between them, the Leviathan, and the French bad guy. There's at least one double cross, probably a death or two. But in the end, the good guys find a way to defeat the French bad guy and subdue the Leviathan peacefully. Why peacefully? Well, first of all, slaying a mindless beast is pretty boring. But second, a major motif of the series thus far is how the Imperial Navy-type characters don't have any respect for the supernatural elements. They always see it as something to be dismissed or controlled. It's the pirates who respect the majesty of the ocean and all that's in it. Plus, this is another way to distinguish the Leviathan from the Kraken. And also, throughout the movie, we keep hearing stories spread through word of mouth about the legendary Jack Sparrow wild and exaggerated tales of his adventures in the previous movies and beyond. We never get to see him, but Sparrow is well on his way to becoming a pirate legend that inspires stories for years to come. Just like how in real life, stories of Davy Jones or Cursed Aztec Gold lasted long enough to inspire these very movies. It's not a perfect pitch, but no pirate six pitch could ever be perfect. However, I think that this idea successfully balances all the issues and obstacles that this franchise currently faces. It's a way forward without Jack Sparrow, and it navigates all the baggage of the series so far. Wow, this video got huge. I never made a video this long before, but it was fun going into such a deep and thorough dive into the series. Will the real Pirate 6 take all of my advice? Or even some of it? Probably not. But I have hope that it'll turn out to be good, so that we can all enjoy more cool pirate movies for the foreseeable future. It's got to be the best part I've ever seen. So it would seem.